All right, folks, welcome back to our MEA 383 History of Popular Music class. This is a brief introduction to our um, to this week's time period. Another 20-year section of Paradise. Um, this is a really interesting one. Um, this is kind of my personal coming of age, born in 71, and... Um, you know, I was there for the late 70s in a way, um, sort of discovering bands like Wings and ELO. Um, it was really, you know, the, those were the closest things to the Beatles that were happening at that time. Um, it was much later before I started to get into, um, you know, what ended up paying the rent f for a couple of decades, which was... Um, a little bit more on the side of roots music, but um, so you know, this time period is um, somewhat more personal for me, I guess. So I'm gonna try not to be too biased, but um, the way that I see this 20 year period um, stacking up in terms of the primary issues, um, you know, you've got to recognize the consolidation part is really big. Um, moving as we will continue to do um, we're currently at three record labels and so moving really into the the apex of the the music business in terms of the money that it generated has ever generated um, the 1990s were um, were pretty much it let's see how this looks that's kind of nice um, <coughs> excuse me and then the, the next big storyline would be um, the formats. So the shifting from vinyl in the early 1980s, um, CD showing up, um, cassette petering out, and then getting onto the precipice of um, you know binary code and um, a download model. So that's a pretty big shift right there. So technology having a... Um, a very powerful effect and fingerprint. And then you get these wild swings in, in sound itself, not so much the sound quality, but the instrumentation that's going on. So um, once again, digital technology, synthesis, um, and those kinds of things creating a the possibility for a very artificial landscape. And then the reaction against that in the early 1990s with grunge and these kind of long arc revival periods that are going back you know, to the 50s and 60s from, from the 90s. Um, and also, you know, I want to share with you a handful of documentaries that uh, three out of four of them I've got access to. Well, I've got access to all four, but it's getting, them, getting you access to them because some are discontinued, some are not approved for distribution in the United States, etc. So it's ridiculousness of that nature, but um, I'll get to those in just a second. So when you look at this idea of label consolidation, um, let's see if I can get this any bigger. That's good. So we're starting, as I mentioned, with the big six, and then in 1999, which is of course at the end of our time period, um, Universal Records buys Polygram Records, and so that gets us down to five. And then you're moving across the first 20 years, um, a couple of decades of the 2000s, you can see um, some of the shifts that are taking place. Um, oops. To get us into more and more consolidation. Now, the fact of that is not altogether evident, um, or the, the impact of it, I guess. Um, you know, yeah, you've got fewer people making more money, but also fewer people making more decisions. And so it tends to tie in with what I consider the, you know, the blanding of uh, popular music, um, more sort of formulaic and derivative, less diverse, that kind of thing. Um, so when you've got fewer people and fewer people, you know, more of them, the higher percentage of like more old white execs, like CEOs of record companies, um, that does have a certain amount of impacts on the music business. 
um, in terms of you know marketing and um, once again diversity of of sound um, and so be aware as we move forward that we're getting into a more and more consolidated situation until finally um, you know nine years ago now I can't believe it's been almost a decade um, we've got uh, a situation where we're down to just three major labels the situation is prime um, as a result as we saw in the 1950s for um, independence to really um, continue their push and grow um, into higher and higher market share I doubt we'll see a complete repetition of what happened in the 50s as you recall with all of the majors sort of getting the tables turned on them but um, it does feel like a good time uh, to be working with an independent label um, so I was mentioning um, you know formats and catalog replacement so a format of music is any medium so we're moving from you know vinyls in the 1970s cassettes in the 1970s of course magnetic tape going all the way back to um, you know World War II so the 1940s but not being part of you know popular music choice until um, you know as a recording format 40s and 50s and then as a consumption format with the 8-track for example in the 1960s cassette tapes in the 60s um, and then um, in about 1981 I think the technology for the compact disc um, was complete and about 1983 if I'm not mistaken you start to see them in some of the, the larger markets as a new platform um, and then of course the genie was out of the bottle completely when they got rid of the physical format altogether and you get into what is now a streaming situation but what started off as downloading and as we'll see when we get to the 2000s you know once that happened it's as if um, you know somebody left the record store open all night with the doors unlocked um, because the owners lost control of that situation and this is the exact um, oh wow I'm way over there sorry about that that is the storyline of the um, the Tower Records um, documentary that's one of the one of the storylines of that documentary so what this means for um, you know the record companies and one of the reasons they were so late to react to the digitization of their property which then led to a period of about 15 years where they had no answer um, to you know they were losing money basically uh, unable to sell their recordings because people were giving them away they had lost all their value from about 2000 to 2015 um, one of the reasons they were so slow to react to that was because every time we change a format it meant that all the customers then who wanted the state of the art went out and bought their entire collection again right so I've got all my favorite stuff on vinyl well now CDs are the big thing um, and so I'm gonna get a CD player in here perfect quality and so people are buying the same stuff over and over and over again and so the profit margins were were high and there was an insulated sense of you know that they couldn't be defeated um, they just couldn't lose and so when the losing hand was finally dealt to them in the form of digital technology um, you know and um, virtual recordings that could be you know traded without any sort of you know security um, it took them a long time to actually see the writing was on the wall and they were uh, a little bit too late so that crash there is in fact exacerbated by all of the built-in easy profit of just waiting for new technology to come along and then making new copies of the same stuff so that people could buy them all over again usually at higher and higher prices so that's a big theme um, over our period um, another big one is 
digital technology on the music instrument side. So these three pieces of gear, we've got a, a sequencer up here, we have a drum machine here, and we have a synthesizer down here. Between those three pieces of gear alone, um, you are well into a situation which is commonplace now, but at the time hadn't really been imagined, except for you know the old one-man band who was, had one foot doing a kick drum and another foot doing a snare, and had a harmonica in the mouth and a guitar, you know, but here you've got computers doing all of the work um, and sometimes with sounds that could be completely cooked up that didn't resemble you know these synthesizers weren't trying to do like oh here's a pretty good version of a trumpet you know it was like press a key and just get your mind blown you know there'd be sounds called alien spaceship landing you know just super weird stuff and so the impact of that on music was that it's almost as if the human touch and what we had known as music from an organic um, sort of, you know, the touch of a talented musician on the string or on the key of the piano, et cetera, um, or the buttons of a horn that, that started to get replaced and removed by um, sounds that were very processed, artificial, but also very exciting at the time you know, in the 1980s so when you get into the the, the new wave right the the new wave of, of European artists coming in that was um, the leading edge of their sound they were really fashion forward so they looked like something no one had seen before they sounded like something no one had seen before and the whole thing was very sort of audacious and daring to a certain extent and so what that did you know when you look at it in the 20 year time time span it became so mechanized and digitized and non-human, sort of robotic in a way, that when you see grunge coming in and the blues revivalists of the 1980s and you know this revindication of roots music and people playing acoustically, like um, all of the unplugged sessions on MTV that were so popular, all of that is a direct backlash and reaction to um, this kind of thing, right, where you've got a robot playing the drums, you've got sounds you've never heard before on synthesizers, uh, and you've got the whole thing recorded into a sequencer that is playing um, while you then do more weird stuff, <laughs> right? So um, interesting period from the sound side. Now I've got, like I said, four documentaries that I consider to be must-see, um, So, and I've got them in order, which I think uh, of what I would recommend. Now I'm still working on getting um, Fogel up and out to you guys, but I have access to it um, and I'm working on getting uh, the same for you. But Hip Hop Beyond Beats and Rhymes basically is talking not only about um, the impact of, you know, going from an independent distribution network to a major label um, distribution for hip hop but also the way that um, the, so the social impact of um, the way that, say, manhood is uh, constructed um, through the lyrics and things like that. So this is an award-winning documentary that talks about um, hip-hop from the perspective of um, a hip-hop lover who was a college quarterback, and um, Byron Hurt is his name. Anyway, so that's the top of the list. And then Who the F is Arthur Fogel is the one that I'm working on now. Um, and this is basically looking at the on the live side of the music industry. Um, you know, we have the Beatles, for example, who quit touring um, because the sound wasn't loud enough to deal with the potential. Um, so they went to like Shea Stadium, for example, and you've got 60,000 screaming kids and a 500 watt PA system there's like no chance of them being heard and they knew that and so they they hung it up and they're like we'll just be a studio band um, well the technology did catch up and the stadium stadia stadiums got bigger um, and so Arthur Fogel is at the center of that and so this is a big trend the, the growth of live music has in fact outstripped um, until you know COVID hit but has been beyond you know, it sort of came to fill in the gap of music business that the record companies, uh, you know, the peer-to-peer -peer, 
um, online piracy, etc., left open. Um, the growth of the independent record company is perhaps over this time period is perhaps best exemplified by Island Records. Um, I put the second half of that video. The first half basically runs from like 1960 to 1975, and the second half is 75 to 2000, which is more you know in line with our time period. But this is you know the story of a, of a um, English expatriate who grew up in. Um, I guess he didn't lose his citizenship, but he grew up in Jamaica and started a record company uh, and ended up mainstreaming um, reggae music uh, and then being kind of the coolest. Uh, it was the label everybody wanted to be on, right? The independent label that everybody wanted to be on was Island. So that's a really fantastic look at the music business from the, over this time period from the perspective of record companies. So there's record companies perspective here. Here is um, live perspective. This is, I would say, um, artist uh, perspective and artist management perspective. Um, and then finally, the perspective of music products or the retail perspective and marketing perspective. So uh, the rise and top fall of Tower Records is all about the, the largest and the last um, record store um, that ended up closing down in the 90s as the um, this sort of writing was on the wall about digital distribution. Um, and so this is another really good perspective on, uh, you know, this image back here. So for, formats and catalog replacement. How did the um, record labels bring things to retail? How does a, uh, you know, a company sort of weather that situation? And they were, the, once again, the biggest one at the time. So these are um, four documentaries that I've got. I've got three of them up on Canvas now. So look for these. Please do take time to uh, at least scan through these because they are, uh, they tell the story from people who were involved in it um, better than I can as someone who was on the consumer side at the time and became a, a professional musician in the 1990s but even then I could see some from the management a lot from the artist side but these perspectives once again will give you a really good sense of what's going on in the music business over one of the times uh, of its of its greatest growth all right so I'll in uh, post the uh, the remaining four document um, presentations uh, shortly here and glad to have you on board